thanks for coming tonight, but I got bad news. The, the story is, has absolutely nothing to do with customer development, lean startups, Steve Blank, Eric Reese, or Alexander Osterwalter. So those of you expecting that could leave now, it's okay. Uh, the other uh, bad news is for those of you who are expecting that the secret history of Silicon Valley is about Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia or Union Square Ventures are also in the wrong room. This really is an interesting story that has its roots back in World War II. And so the first half of the presentation, a lot of you are going to be scratching your head going, why are we watching a war movie? I thought we were going to learn about the secret history of Silicon Valley. So I'm just giving you some heads up for those of you who thought you were coming where history was like 1995. Uh, this goes back a lot further than that. And the reason why I uh, gave this talk is that the popular view of Silicon Valley, at least from my students at Stanford in the engineering school, when I said, well, where does Silicon Valley come from? And my students go, oh, yeah, 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 it was started by Mark Zuckerberg. You know, it's all about social media. OK, all right. Uh, well, think a little harder. You know, anybody remember what came before social media? Oh, we get it, the internet. Mark Andreas and some real old guy. I think he's bald and, you know, he's some venture capitalist. And no, 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 before that, oh, yeah, the guy who died. What's his name? Uh, you know, Steve Jobs. Didn't he, like, invent Silicon Valley? And I'm, like, I'm feeling very old, because Jobs was my age. Um, and, and I go, well, how about, you know, what computers are built for? At Stanford, there are buildings named after these guys. They're scratching their head, and they go, oh, you know, Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, founders of Fairchild and Intel. And so I go, well, what came before that in the Valley? And everybody kind of looks at each other and goes, fruit orchards, fruit orchards, fruit orchards, maybe you would Packard and more fruit orchards. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of the popular view of, like, students sitting at Stanford in ground zero in a building called the Terman Engineering Building. I just want you to remember that name, the Terman Engineering Building. This is a discussion going on in this building. And this talk really is about one of those blank fruit orchard spaces, which is when the valley really was microwave and defense valley in the 1950s and the 1960s. Ooh. Um, um, and this story is where entrepreneurship started in Silicon Valley and why it started in the valley. And, um, a few caveats. Anybody in the room want to admit that they have or ever worked on black programs? A anybody? Um, so if you've been in the security business, uh, you know, I just want to let everybody know I'm not a professional historian. Um, more importantly, I'm an ex-marketeer. That means I could say anything. Um, uh, and so that means some or all of this is probably wrong. Uh, and all secrets for anybody who's been in classified projects are from open source literature. And, and I made sure they were nowadays, given uh, Snowden and, and, and the rest. So I'm going to tell the story in a few short stories. And how Silicon Valley actually came to be, actually started in World War II, which was the first electronic war. Now, I don't know if anybody in this room is old enough, but when I was a kid, what you used to watch on TV were old World War II movies. Anybody ever see old World War II movies? Anybody? Like... A couple. And old World War II movies, you know, Army and whatever, and, you know, airplanes and bombers, etc. It turns out every World War II movie ever made that had a bomber plane in it was wrong. It was wrong. And part of the story is telling you what the filmmakers just never knew and why World War II really was the beginning of Silicon Valley. And the first part is going to be a little wonky history. Um, December 7th, 1941, and I'm going to give you an American-centric view. America enters World War II. Britain and France are fighting since September 1939 in Europe. The Soviets are fighting massive land and air battles uh, since they were invaded by Germany in June 1941. And the Allies, British, French, Soviet Union, are incapable of landing in Western Europe for another two years, just not strong enough to take the continent back from Germany. And so what they decide was that the priority was to win the war in Europe first, and then the Pacific. And the only way the Allies could win the war in Europe first is they decide to try to destroy Germany's war fighting capacity from the air. First air war ever. And they come up with an idea called the Strategic Bombing Campaign of Germany. And the charter of the Strategic Bombing Campaign was your primary objective 
will be the progressive destruction and dislocation of the German military, industrial, and economic system, and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. There was a belief in this first air war that perhaps we wouldn't even have to invade, we could just bomb Germany into submission. And the planes they used to do that was two types. It was a combined bomber offensive. The British used their bombers to bomb at night. Lancasters and Halifaxes, four-engine propeller planes, unpressurized. The crew wore little oxygen masks. Planes flew at a couple hundred miles an hour, seven to 17,000 feet. And the British decided after some experience in the beginning of the war that the bombers weren't accurate enough and the German air defense system was so deadly during daytime that they were going to bomb at night. The bad news is, is that at night they could barely see cities. And so they euphemistically decided, the British, that their goal was, quote, to dehouse the German population, which was a euphemism for we were going to destroy cities with civilians. The Americans said, well, we have this great bomb site. We could put a bomb right through a pickle barrel, down the chimney, and whatever. We're going to do precision bombing, and our planes have enough guns and, and equipment to defend from any German uh, attacks during the day. And we were going to use B-17s and B-24s, also unpressurized, to bomb Germany. And we were going to go after industrial targets. And we were going to be so accurate, you know, just one fleet of uh, bombers will take them out. By the way, after World War II, there was a strategic bombing survey that found out that 80% of the bombs fell within a five-mile radius. Just for accuracy here, you just kind of got to figure that out. Uh, and that's in daytime. Um, and, and so here was this combined bomber offensive. You have to understand, in World War II, it wasn't one plane taking off. There were first 100, then 200, then 500, then ultimately 1,000 bomber missions over occupied Germany. Planes would take off, take off over England, orbit, form up, and head over the English Channel. And it looks something like this. And so they're forming up. They fly in formation to defend each other. And that's what it looked like about to head over the English Channel. But what the British and Americans never knew as they were forming up over England is that the Germans had developed the most sophisticated air defense system the world had ever seen. Um, and facing them were these Allied planes, 28,000 active combat planes. Let me just set the scene for you. By the way, anybody know how many uh, planes are in the entire jet fleet today? Anybody know? 18,000 worldwide. There were 18, about 6,000 in the US, but good guess. 18,000 worldwide. There were 28,000 active combat planes just in Western Europe. And just to set the scale what was going on here, there were 40,000 of them lost during the war, either damaged or destroyed. U.S. was just turning out planes like cookies from factories in the U.S. running 24-7. Unfortunately, if you were one of the crew, it was more dangerous to be on an air crew over Western Europe than it was to be a Marine fighting in the Pacific on Iwo Jima or Guadalcanal. And by the way, 46,000 planes were lost by the USSR in the east. Uh, 160,000 Americans British were killed, wounded, or captured just in the air. It's a lot more dangerous than losing your luggage on Delta. I mean, it was pretty serious. Uh, so these planes took off, headed to occupied Europe to bomb, and what they didn't know is the Germans had an integrated air defense system called the Kammuber line. And it was an integrated electronic air defense network. It covered France, the Low Countries, and into northern Germany, and its job was to do three things. Warn and detect, say the bombers are coming, help the Germans target and aim their weapons, whether they were fighter planes or anti-aircraft guns, and to destroy the bombers, hopefully before they got to the targets, if not on their way home. And what they had was a whole set of early warning radars, which was a fancy name for radars that could look a long way 
in occupied France that were staring over England. What the Americans and British never knew is both those planes were forming up, the Germans were already detecting them as they were orbiting. In fact, here was the early warning range, and you could see it, that little dash red line, if you could make it out, actually covered most of the bomber bases in southern England. And what the Germans had built were a whole series of early warning radars. Um, 20 of these, the first phased array radar, for any of you technical, this was somewhat of a miracle for 1940s. Um, a giant, uh, two, almost 200-foot tower, built 150 of these. Um, built another mo modern-looking one that rotated, built 80 of these. And basically, these were just the early warning radars to tell them the bombers were coming. And then what they did was divided up occupied Europe in a box, like a 20 by 30 box called the Himmel Belt. And inside that belt was an integrated network of short-range radars, something called FLAC, which is a fancy shortened German name for guns that pointed up to the sky and shot big shells at planes fighter planes to shoot down the bombers, and searchlights at night to find the British bombers to aim those uh, guns and to help the fighter planes pick them up. And so what would happen is, the, in this Himmel Belt, there would be an early warning short-range radar called Freya, and it was basically used to detect those bombers after the long-range radar had picked them up. And by the way, this is what they looked like. There were a thousand of these, one thousand of these, deployed in occupied Europe. These were mobile and steerable. And the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, also had kind of their version of the National Security Agency. They were able to detect any airplane that was using their radio. So here are the airplanes where bombers were talking to each other. The Luftwaffe single, uh, Signals Intelligence Service was direction finding on those voices and were able to plot the bombers, not only from the radar, but from direction finding from all the signals they were putting out. By the way, the bombers are now crossing the English Channel. Navigator, do you estimate we've crossed the enemy coast? Yes, sir. We sure have. Now, those little black puffy things are not clouds. <laughs> Only some of you are laughing. Those are exploding shells called anti-aircraft fire from those flak guns. And from the minute those bombers crossed the English Channel, they had to go through a stream of anti-aircraft shells trying to shoot them down. Just for scale, there were 15,000 of them between the English Channel and Germany. And what no one knew at the time is they just wasn't pointing these guns by hand or by eye. It took us years to understand what the Germans had connected to them were anti-aircraft radars. And they built 5,000 of these. So while the bombers were flying in, they were t detected by long-range radar, short-range radar uh, picked them up, cued the anti-aircraft guns that were now tracking the bombers with radar. And so now the order of battle went from this early warning radar to this anti-aircraft gun, and then another radar, which actually controlled the fighter planes. So, by the way, the bombers not only had to fly through this anti-aircraft fire, they had to fly through fighter planes, constantly attacking them. And the fighter planes and the bombers were being intersected. Think of anti-air air, air traffic control. Instead of trying to land the planes safely, this air traffic control were trying to shoot them down. Makes a bad day on United seem pretty good, right? Um, and in fact, we had no idea any of this was going on. We were just flying planes over, trying to drop bombs, and the planes were getting shot out of the sky, had no idea what was going on. Until one day, along the occupied France coast, some British Spitfire plane was taking pictures of the German defenses in, along the coast, and I think he was also scouting out for after the war where he was going to get a nice chateau, because he takes a picture and it looks like this. What a great house. And by the way, the coast is kind of right on the bottom. And beautiful chateau. But someone says, what the heck is this? And for the first time, American and British intelligence realized that the Germans have deployed thousands of things that are not swimming pools on their side, but are actually radar dishes. But this is before anybody could 
type Google and say Würzburg radar, frequency, you know, pulse width, range, etc. And the only way to get intelligence to figure out what this was, was the typical British way to solve a problem. They decided to steal it. <laughs> so they had a commando raid in February 1942, and they stole not only all the electronics, but they took the technicians as well to help them read the manuals. And go, hey, what does this mean? Oh, I can't, oh yes, okay, I'll tell you. And so, and they figured out how much the rent would be after the war in the chateau. But, but basically, for the first time, the British and Americans now had some real hard intelligence on these radars, and they freaked out. Because they were accurate, they were good, they were integrated into a network. Um, and we started using it to test how can somehow we do something about them. By the way, these were the radars that used... Uh, we were not only having to fly against the anti-aircraft guns, but we were having to fly against German fighters. And these radars were actually talking the German fighters into the stream of bombers. And by the way, all this radar data, all of it, was being fed truly into an air traffic control system called the Himmelbelt. These were giant bunkers. Um, operators actually w uh, worked in something that looked like a theater in front of a huge screen like this. And the positions of the American and German bombers were plotted with little moving images. And the positions of the German fighters were plotted. And the goal was to get the fighters to intercept the bombers. And the fighters would orbit around the radio beacon, and the fighter controller would say, turn right, turn left, etc. It's really kind of hairy if you were on a US or British bomber. Um, the fighters would turn on their radar, acquire the target, and attack. And so one of the other things we never knew was how were the German fighters at night could find the British bombers. It turns out that we never knew the German fighter planes looked like this. Anybody see something weird about this plane? They went, what the heck is this? This was the first fighter plane anybody had ever put air-to-air -air radar on. Because there was no way to see planes at pitch black at night, yet the German fighters kept figuring out exactly where they were. And what they had was what was called airborne intercept radar, and there was a, somebody who sat in the back seat they were directed to the vicinity of the bombers by ground radar, turn right, turn left. But when they got close, they would turn on their short range radar and they had control panel, little radar scope and a back seater would steer the plane right into the bomber stream so they could use their guns to shoot them down. Now during the daytime, the fighter, German fighter planes didn't need onboard radar. They could see the American bombers just coming by the hundreds. And if you were inside an American bomber, You've been dodging flak that is in our aircraft fire, and then this happened. Now, you were in that big bomber. The reason why they're not moving around is they're big, they're heavy, they're slow, and those fighter planes are coming at you in all directions. And all you had were these manually controlled machine guns to try to fight them off. You're dodging flak for hours, you're dodging fighter planes for hours, and again, you're being attacked by German day fighters continually. Escher Schmitz and Fock Wolf 190s. And when you finally got over the target... Manager Bombardier, you're flying the airplane now. It's all yours. Bombay doors open. You can see the flak exploding around them. Now, in every World War II movie, it's always a clear day, right? And you always hit the target, um, which is kind of interesting because um, if anybody's ever been from Europe or been in Europe, uh, you kind of know there's not many clear days in winter over Europe, yet they bombed 
365 days. And for 50 years, no one ever asked, how did they see the ground? How did they have any idea, like, which direction they were heading? It turned out one of the other secrets of uh, World War II is we built air-to-ground bombing radar. We actually put radar sets on bombers, pathfinders, that actually had little map overlays that says, oh, I could see a river and I could see the outline of a city. I hope that's Hamburg, not London. Um, and most of the time, they, they got it right. And so this radar could be arm, uh, aimed at the ground. Outlines of major ground features could be seen. There were map overlays. Um, again, 1943, they were put on Pathfinder planes, meaning the bombers that went first, um, and allowed bombing 24-7. Now, by the way, just as an aside, you're flying through FLAC. You're flying, fly, flying through fighter planes. This is the only war effort the Allies can make to help the Soviet Union that's fighting massive million-man land battles in the east. Allies can't land on the west. All they could do is bomb Germany for the next couple of years. Yet the Germans' goal was to make bombing so expensive in not only airplanes, but in train crew that the Allies had to stop. And it came real close. Because let me do the math challenge for you. For every 100 bombers on a mission, in these early years, 4 to 20% wouldn't return. Now, that's bad enough for one mission. But to go home, you had to fly 25 missions. The good news is none of these crew were math majors. All right. And the bad news is they were all younger than you. Average age of the crews were about 19. Flying 25 missions through flak, through fighter planes, for hours to reach targets over occupied Europe and try to come back and how to get up and do it day after day. And the Germans were winning. The losses were pretty horrific. And so the Allied command says, we got to solve this problem. And that's story two. Now, by the way, by now, some of you might be going, I thought this was about Silicon Valley. Trust me, we're about to get there. But it's a long way home. What the Allies decide is we need to understand the German air defense system, and we need to figure out how to shut it down. And literally in the span of less than a year, we invent an entire new industry called signals intelligence or electronics intelligence, and another industry called electronic warfare. We set up a secret lab at Harvard called the Harvard Radio Research Lab, which had nothing to do with Harvard and nothing to do with radio or research. It was actually a secret lab to try to fix this electronic air defense system problem that the Germans had set up. Its goal was to reduce losses to fighters and flak so we can continue to bomb Germany. And step one is we had to understand the German air defense system. Yeah, the British had like stolen one radar, but there was no way we could go in and steal all those radars. We didn't even know what kinds there were. And so we needed to figure out how to record these signals and analyze them and then build some way to shut them down from the air, to jam them, to confuse them. And what we needed to do was to first map what were these radars out there, and then was there some mechanical means to shut them down, and there, was there some electronic means. This was an 800-person lab. Had some of the most advanced electronics and microwave engineers in the planet. Top secret probably never even heard of it today. Next to the atomic bomb and cryptography, breaking the enigma, this was probably, this and radar, the most important thing we did in World War II. And by the way, electronic intelligence to figure out these German radars. Radar, unlike radio signals, goes line of sight, meaning you had to get real close to that radar dish if you wanted to analyze it. Well, to get real close means you had to fly over occupied Europe with lots of guns and stuff sticking up in the air. But what they did was they took a bomber, a B-24, stripped out all the bombs, and even took out all the guns, and fitted those planes and made them into the first electronic intelligence planes to fly inside of Germany and record all these radar signals. 
They were fitted with receivers and displays, wire and strip recorders, and for those of you into electronics, they were, could, could record everything from 50 megahertz to 3 gigahertz, and this is the 1940s. Kind of amazing. And so they vacuum cleaned up all these signals, and they came back and were able to decide how to shut down the German air defense system. And they used this to map, by the way, all the radar coverage. This happens to be the actual map, top, top, top secret, of the Japanese radar coverage around the home islands that was hand-drawn in 1943. The first thing we discovered is if you want to jam or shut down or confuse anybody's radar set, German, Japanese, American, you could cut a piece of tinfoil to half the wavelength of that radar set and throw that tinfoil right in front of the radar, and the operator would just see noise. Happens with anybody's radar. Just a, it just, that radar would actually get confused by that tinfoil. So, but the first thing they needed to know was what was the wavelength, that is, what frequency was the radar dish working on, and these signals intelligence planes told them that. But the next question is, well, wait a minute. Can we, like, equip a bunch of spies with tinfoil and have them throw the tinfoil in front of all these radars? In front? And they said, well, that would take about 35,000 spies, and they'd all get shot, and we couldn't get enough in them, so that won't work. And then someone said, well, why don't we put tinfoil on every one of the bombers? And when people stopped laughing, <laughs> what are you going to do, drop tinfoil out of the planes? That's what we did for three years over Germany. We cut strips of aluminum foil to half the frequency of these Würzburg radars. And for those of you math majors, you could figure it out. Frequency was 540 megahertz. Turns out you cut aluminum foil to about 10 inches. Each plane tossed out 46,000 packets. Now remember, these are unpressurized planes. So the lowest ranking crewman strapped himself in. They opened the door. As the bomber stream is getting near the target where the radars are, they said, OK, start tossing out the tinfoil. We did. The first time this was ever used, and this is where it's both funny and sad, was the British tried it for the first time in July in 1943 over a city called Hamburg. And for the first time, British lost zero planes, completely shut down the entire German air defense system. They had no idea what they were. All the radars went to noise. They couldn't figure out where the planes were. And for you know, those of you who know history, the British burned Hamburg to the ground, killed 100,000 people, shut down the German air defense system. The other so somewhat funny side effect is it used three quarters of all the aluminum foil in the United States in World War II. And when they were having aluminum foil drives, no one could understand how they were able to make airplanes out of aluminum foil. What were they doing? Was there some secret way to do this? It turns out that we were dropping chaff. And in fact, if you talk to somebody of the right age who lived through World War II in Germany and Denmark and Norway, et cetera, they would say, yeah, it rained the aluminum foil for years. Um, and their stuff was all over the ground. But that was a mechanical way to do this. It turns out the connection with Silicon Valley is we soon discovered that we could make these microwave transmitters and put them on all the planes to systematically shut down all the German radars. And while these transmitters weren't very powerful by themselves, they were being carried by hundreds and thousands of planes on a raid. And so they shut down these, they were called jammers. They shut down the early warning radars, and the aircraft radars, and the fighter radars, and the ground control radars. We had factories running 24-7, and we made 30,000 of these during World War II. These were the most complicated pieces of microwave and electronics the world had ever seen, and we were in industrial production. And every bomber that went over occupied Europe by the end of 1944 and 1945 had these. And the British were jam jamming the German night fighter radar as well. And we had figured out the jammer versus radar coverage. And we built jammers to actually cover every one of the frequency bands that the Germans had. And they had no idea what was going on. They could see it from the captured bombers that would crash, but they had no idea of the massive production behind it. By the end of World War II, a bomber stream, yeah, it consisted of bombers, but literally 
surrounding the bombers were planes that just had chaff, planes that just had jammers, uh, fighter planes that were protecting the bomber stream, and the Germans had no ability to shoot down these bombers by the end of the war. Now, what this has to do with Silicon Valley, finally, <sighs> sorry about the history, is the question is, who ran this secret lab? What, what was going on here? Who was this person, and what happened to him? Turns out, the guy who ran this lab and became the father of electronic intelligence and electronic warfare, remember, the Harvard Radio Research Lab, 800 people, the director was a kindly professor from Stanford named Fred Terman. You remember this name. Now, who was Terman? Actually, he's the name most of you have never heard of. He's actually the father of Silicon Valley. He was a Stanford professor of engineering. You might know his graduate students named Hewlett and Packard. He helped them start their company, and he sat on their board from the day he, they, they founded the company in 1938. He was the guy who wrote the most advanced textbook on electronics at the time. It was called Radio Engineering. And he became the dean of engineering of Stanford in 1946, and it's provost. Think of it as COO in 1955. But what's really interesting is what he did to Stanford and Silicon Valley during the Cold War. When Terman came back from World War II, he was on a mission from God. And let me just give you some perspective. In World War II, the US military and our government did something that no other country ever did and changed the nature of it. Anybody go to Columbia here or any university, research university? Changed your careers forever. You don't know it. There was a single scientist ex-head of engineering of MIT, who had some experience with working for the military and the Navy in World War I, said, World War II is going to be a technology war, and the US military is going to screw it up. How the military built weapons up to then was they drafted scientists, assigned them to military weapons labs, and it was the military who decided what the weapons were, which were going to be built. This guy's name was Vannevar Bush, and he convinced President Roosevelt that civilians ought to build the weapons for the military. And the final compromise was the civilians and the military were going to build weapons. But we agreed that we were not going to draft scientists into the military. We were going to assign them to universities and give them weapons systems projects. We were going to give them radar. We were going to give them electronic warfare. And then we originally gave them the atomic bomb. And it was civilians who were going to be running these programs, and there were 10,000 of them in World War II who were part of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. And this group was organized in 19 different divisions and five committees and two panels. Uh, but the only thing you guys should know here is Harvard was where the Electronic Warfare Center was. But Caltech got rockets. MIT got radar, and believe it or not, Columbia was the center of undersea warfare, Columbia. Every major university on the East Coast got massive funds for research and development on a scale they had never seen before. And this World War II Office of Science, uh, Science and Development spent close to a half a billion dollars feeding it into MIT, Caltech, Harvard, Columbia, Oh, and by the way, Stanford, Stanford University, let me tell you what the country thought of Stanford University, 50,000 bucks, for teacher training. The only guy they thought was worthwhile was Fred Terman, and they made him go to Harvard. And by the way, what happened to the OSRD? It became the National Science Foundation, the Atomic Energy Commission, the Department of Defense, and the NIH all spun out of this World War II effort. And then in 1958, we added NASA and DARPA. We still use this structure to fund $60 billion a year in university research. Any of you in university research, this is where you're getting your funding from. But back to Terman. He came back to Stanford and said, we're going to focus on microwave and electronics, and I'm never going to be screwed out of government dollars again at Stanford. 
And by this time, he was dean of engineering, and he recruited the 11 best members of his team from Harvard and says, congratulations, you're now faculty tenured at Stanford. And they went, well, that was quick. Uh, and by 1950, five years, he turned Stanford into the MIT of the West for microwave and electronics. Students came from all over the US because this was the center of excellence. Now, story four is what was going on in the world around him. It turns out, some of you might remember, post-World War II, we were in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. The battlefield essentially moved 500 miles to the east, not from Germany, but now to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a closed country. We had no idea what was going on inside, so electronic intelligence Electronic countermeasures, electronic warfare become critical. Stanford becomes the center of excellence for the CIA, National Security Agency, Navy and Air Force to figure out what's going on inside the Soviet Union and Terman starts a weapons lab inside the engineering school. The Cold War became an electronic war. The Russians, they modeled their air defense system after the Germans and then added surface air missiles and our job was to understand it and defeat it. They started building ICBMs, strategic missiles, and building bombers. We needed to monitor the telemetry of how they were testing those missiles. And we needed photo reconnaissance to find out how many they had and where they were. And they were building nuclear armed submarines. We needed to monitor and track them. And they were building nuclear weapons. And we needed to understand where they were, how many, where they were producing them. This was a closed country. We weren't at war with them, so there was no legal way for us to kind of fly over them and get this data. Now, back at Stanford, the Korean War changed the nature of the research going on at Stanford. We had an applied electronics lab, which basically the military said applied was a euphemism for we'd really like you to stop doing research only and actually start focusing on some actual stuff we could use on real airplanes in a real war. And it made, for the first time, the university a partner in the military-industrial complex. It's about 1953. A good example is, remember those jammers in World War II where planes were flying in in hundreds of thousands? Turns out, the new theory was a nuclear-armed bomber would fly in by himself. And so the jammers on that plane needed to be more powerful and more agile. And in World War II, low-power jammers could uh, be added up by having hundreds of planes protect each other. And they needed to be frequency agile. And so Stanford worked on something called electronically tunable microwave power tubes. And they did a great job and built something called backward wave os oscillators. At the same time, these receivers needed higher bandwidth, higher frequencies. Stanford built something called traveling wave tubes. Basically, Stanford starting, started building microwave components for the military but they did something incredibly different. Terman said, we're not going to keep this stuff inside of Stanford. We're going to encourage our graduate students to leave and spin them out. This is a big idea. Terman said, we don't want to be in production of these systems. We want someone else to be making them. And so starting with Terman, a series of microwave startups started leaving Stanford and staying around Silicon Valley and actually started getting government weapons contracts. At the same time, Stanford was having essentially trade shows for the Air Force, Navy, Army, CIA, and NSA. Here was a schedule from one of those trade shows from 1955, which showed off all this advanced microwave electronics and new concepts. Stanford joined the black world by merging their unclassified laboratory and the applied electronics laboratory. And for a decade and a half, in the engineering school was an armed guard protecting this building. It became the systems engineering lab. Same year, Terman became pro provost. And the engineering lab now started focusing on practical applications of real intelligence problems for the Air Force, CIA, NSA, etc., And combined all these components into real systems. And they used the PhD students and the engineering school staff to work on these weapon systems. And Terman recreates 
essentially the Harvard Radio Research Lab in the middle of Stanford University. In fact, by the mid-1960s, three-quarters of all the graduate theses in this department are classified, just for scale. So some of the problems, the practical problems, were how do we find out the radars inside the Soviet Union? You know, the NSA and CIA needed to know, the Strategic Air Command needed to know, and we understood the periphery of the Soviet Union, what was there, but we had no idea what was inside the middle. And the reason we needed to know that was this. Well, boys, we got three engines out, we got four holes in us, and a horse trader's mule. The radio is gone, and we're leaking fuel. And if we was flying any lower, why we need sleigh bells on this thing? But we've got one little budget on them rooskies. This height, why they might harpoon us, but they dang sure ain't gonna spot us on no radar screen. So, some of you might recognize that from. Dr. Strangelove, our primary weapon systems in the mid-1950s were B-52 bombers whose job it was was to penetrate the Soviet Union, fly around their radars, and attack targets. The problem is we really didn't know much about both the interior, and we kind of knew something about the exterior, uh, but it, it wasn't quite clear. And by the way, the way we knew about the exterior is we developed a fleet of electronic intelligence planes, and I mean a fleet. Um, Hundreds of planes flew around the Soviet Union on a daily basis, measured the Soviet air defense system, and actually told us that their low-altitude coverage was good, their high-altitude coverage was actually great, and continually tracked through communications intelligence all the dispositions of the Soviet fighters and their aircraft guns, etc. Um, the problem with these electronic intelligence planes is you had to get close. What most people don't know is during the 1950s and 60s, we were in a shooting war with the Soviet Union. We lost 23 electronic intelligence planes around the periphery. 250 Navy and Air Force airmen were shot down. And this was a cat and mouse game. In fact, this list, if you could make out the pilot and weapon, is actually from the old Soviet Union with the name of the pilot, the aircraft, and the weapon they used to shoot down the American planes. Um, post. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, we kind of decided this was probably a very bad game of chicken, and we kind of dialed it back. Uh, but this was an active game going on. So Stanford was doing basic research in electronics. Stanford and SRI uh, were doing applied research. And microwaves and systems companies in Silicon Valley were producing equipment for the military. And the systems now started to get really interesting, where we were not only making components, we were spinning out entire companies that were making integrated systems. Um, GE Microwave, Applied the Technology, ESL, Argo Systems, Advent. Why this is important is Fred Terman changed the rules in Silicon Valley because the valley as we know it starts with this guy. He basically said Stanford's going to be an outward-facing university. And if you don't understand the, the phrase outward-facing, you ought to understand that if you went into Stanford in the 1950s and said, I want to start a company, Fred Terman would shake your hand, say, take whatever you want out of the lab and do good for your country. Try that in any other university, not in the 50s or 60s or 70s. Try that today in a good number of universities worldwide. He encouraged graduate students to start the companies. He encouraged professors to consult for companies completely unheard of. Not just large companies, but startups. And Terman and other professors actually take board seats on these startups. And technology and IP transfer, it was a handshake. Um, getting out in the real world was good for your academic career starting in the 1950s. Unbelievable. Now, just to put this in perspective, what Stanford had in Silicon Valley's first wave is for infrastructure, it had great research universities. It had a culture of risk taking, the entrepreneurial free flow of people and information. It didn't have much management tools, but the motivation was crisis. And the ecosystem was entrepreneurs and weapons finance. There was, there was no venture capital. How these companies got financed was Terman introduced them to weapon systems manufacturers. Hey, you want to buy the latest microwave whatever? Here, talk to Use Aircraft or talk to TRW. And so it was weapons finance that drove Silicon Valley from the 50s to the 60s. I'll give you one or two more stories and we'll wrap this up.
Some of these interesting things going on in the late 50s and early 60s involve spy planes. Anybody recognize this plane? Um, called the, officially called the Oxcart A12, which is a CIA reconnaissance plane. Publicly, it was the, the two-seater version was known as the SR-71. And the CIA was kind of worried about, can we actually fly this at 85,000 feet or 90,000 feet over the Soviet Union? Would they be able to see it and track it at Mach 3? Um, the Soviet air defense system was like evolving faster than we could build um, spy planes. And so the Electronic Intelligence Office and the CIA said, what's the environment look like inside the Soviet Union? And what the Soviets had built were these advanced long-range radars called Tall Kings. They could see of almost 400 miles. But they were located inside the Soviet Union, not just on the outside, but the inside. And we wanted to know where these radars were so these planes could avoid them. But without flying over the Soviet Union, which we did a couple of times, but it would have been real dangerous to kind of hunt around and look for these, we said, is there any way to find these radars? Where are they located? How many are there? Now, you got to remember, radar goes straight out into space. Well, someone said, hey, what's in space over the Soviet Union? Now, this is before satellites. And someone, well, there's nothing over the Soviet Union. There's just space. And someone said, well, if there was something over the Soviet Union, wouldn't the radar signals kind of bounce off and we could measure them? But someone said, yeah, 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 that's true, but there's just space out there. Don't you get it? It's space. The radar is going straight out to space. And someone else said, no, no, no. Isn't the moon over the Soviet Union at least like once a month? And someone went, well, yeah, the moon's over there. Isn't some of that radar signal going to hit the moon and maybe bounce off and come back to Earth? And they went, yeah, but you'd need these giant dishes to pick up that faint signal. And someone said, well, why don't we point some dishes at the moon? They said, you don't understand. These would have to be big radio dishes. I mean, giant radio dishes. So in the late 1950s, the U.S. becomes the most interested country in the world in radio astronomy. And we fund every radio dish you've ever heard of. Jordal Bank, Sugar Grove, Arecibo, we're all covered for finding tall kings. Stanford Dish, anybody ever been to Stanford, walked the dish? All those were funded through recover agencies and the entire radio, anybody in radio astronomy? It turns out the entire industry was funded through a cover of the CIA because we were actually trying to find the tall king radars. And we actually did. As the moon moved over the Soviet Union, um, once a month, somebody would move into a secret room in these radio dishes, kind of plot the locations, and we were able to figure out where all the tall kings were. And every time you hike at Stanford, in the back, there's the Stanford dish. Um, and uh, that's how we got it. The other one is in the early 1960s, we decided to build this giant balloon called Echo. Does anybody remember Echo? Um, it was a giant balloon we were going to uh, put into space, and it was, the cover was radio relay tests. It was another electronic intelligence thing. We were going to put these balloons, and so we were going to pick up radio signals over the Soviet Union. Originally, we were going to be launched from Vandenberg, but by the time it got its act together, we actually had satellites up. And the best story was... There was a project that was going to put 400 million three-quarter inch pieces of copper wire in orbit around the Earth. And again, its cover story was, oh, we're going to do some radio relay tests. And what they really wanted to do was put a permanent ring around the Soviet Union so we could pick up all the reflections from the Soviet radar. Luckily, common sense happened. And we actually started flying spy satellites rather than copper wire. Now, what does this have to do with Silicon Valley, really? Turns out in 1956, it all changed for the Valley. Both Silicon and the Secret Valley really happened in this year. In 1956, an aircraft manufacturer from Burbank, California, won a contract to build something called the submarine-launched ballistic missile, something called the Polaris and then eventually the Poseidon and Trident. And there was no room in Southern California, so they came to a place that was just known as the Valley of Heart's Delight. It was filled with fruit orchards. It was Sunnyvale, California. And Lockheed sets up Lockheed Missiles and Space Division and builds the Polaris missile 
submarine launched ballistic missile on an assembly line in Sunnyvale. Built by Lockheed. Lockheed goes from zero to 20,000 employees in Sunnyvale, California in four years. Four years later, they have 35,000 employees. Just for scale, Hewlett Packard has 3,000. Silicon Valley, which people think about as chips and test equipment, etc., was a defense valley from the 50s all the way up through the 80s. By the way, Lockheed was at least publicly admitting they were building these submarine-launched ballistic missiles, but what no one else ever knew is they were also building all our spy satellites. Corona, Samos, Midas, Vela, and advanced other satellites on secret assembly lines in a town north of Sunnyvale called East Palo Alto. Anybody ever been to Silicon Valley, East Palo Alto? Um, they found an abandoned helicopter factory and set up an assembly line for Corona and something else. I'll show you there's something else. Corona was the first photo reconnaissance spy satellite. 150 were built on an assembly line in secret in East Palo Alto, launched from Vandenberg. And what's really cool is that the satellite ejected film and an airplane flew around as that capsule was floating down on a parachute, snagged it midair, opened it up, sent the film for development. We did this every six weeks or so and had full coverage of the Soviet Union and now could see all the things we could never see before. Um, launched this from 1960 to 1972. And by the way, to launch these satellites, we discovered that we needed kind of a space bus and so Lockheed developed a second stage called the Gina. And the cover story was, oh, it was a space target, kind of like radio relay. It controlled all 1960s spy satellites. And they had another secret assembly line with 365 of these being built year after year. And by the way, American reconnaissance systems went from this little corona circled in red, and just for scale, that's the size of a person, to something called the hexagon. Now the hexagon was the size of a school bus. And just to give you the scale of what they were building in Sunnyvale, here's the hexagon, here's a person. And those little gold things are the ejectable ca film capsules. It was the last of the film return spy satellites. Now something funny is when I was in Silicon Valley, every once in a while, I'd see something leaving the base that Lockheed was on, and it looked like this. I thought it was a horse trailer. But if you look really close, and you can't see it from where you're sitting, but the horses were painted on. They were actually driving the hexagon satellite from the Lockheed assembly plant down to Vandenberg in something disguised as a horse trailer. I thought that was a great photo, and they had just declassified this. Um, by the way, back to electronic intelligence, the reason why we no longer put you know, copper wires in space and balloons and this other stuff is we put the first electronic intelligence satellites in space over the Soviet Union. We could now orbit satellites that, were co co that would collect radar signals from Soviet air defense radars, record it, store it, and dump it back so we could figure out where they were. Used by the Strategic Air Command for the Electronic Order of Battle, given to the National Reconnaissance Office, and the Navy started doing this. In World War II, one of the biggest problems of the U.S. Navy was where is the enemy fleet? You would fly airplanes, try to figure it out. Are they over here? Are they over there? We discovered you throw satellites up, and you could triangulate Soviet radar and radio admissions from their ships. All of a sudden, we could now make sure that no enemy ship could ever hide. And so the Poppy Project was the first electronic sat, um, intelligence program to actually intercept Soviet shipping, triangulate the, uh, and uh, direction find. Now, by the way, all this was going on at Stanford. It was great. Terman believed he was doing the right thing for the country in the Cold War, 1945 till April 1968. In 1968, 30% of Stanford R&D funding in electronics was for classified work. 50% of Stanford Research Institute's work was from the Department of Defense. In April 1969, 400 students rioted in the middle of the Vietnam War and occupied these labs. 
started throwing classified documents out the window and started exposing what was going on. And Stanford decides to move all classified programs off of campus into Silicon Valley. Now, by the way, 1956, besides Lockheed, one last story. So far, we haven't figured out why it's Silicon Valley. Because if you would have believed Terman and Lockheed, we would have become Microwave Valley. But in 1956, on the other side of town, the head of radar bombing training, remember that air-to-ground bombing radar? There was a guy who went around the world training the military on how to use it. The valley moves into integrated circuits. And the question was, who did this? What happened in 1956? So this guy was first the director of anti-submarine warfare operations group at Columbia here in New York. And then he became head of radar bombing training for the Air Force. Do I know who he is? Then he became deputy director of R&D for weapons systems evaluation in the Defense Department. Still don't recognize him? He was the co-inventor of the transistor and won the Nobel Prize in 1955. He founded the first semiconductor company on the West Coast. His name was William Shockley. You may recognize this name. Other father of Silicon Valley. Shockley was the world's best researcher, world's best talent spotter, and in spite of what you think of your boss, truly was the world's worst manager in Silicon Valley history. Because he hired some of the most spectacular engineers and in 15 months, eight of them leave. Can't stand working for the guy. These eight people found Fairchild Semiconductor. And two of them leave eight years later, Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, and found Intel. Coming out of Shockley Semiconductor is 65 other chip companies in the next 20 years from this one startup. And just to give you a picture, here's Shockley on the left. And let's zoom back out, and you can see all the genealogy of all the chip companies from this one guy. So Shockley's legacy, it's Silicon Valley. But no one else remembers him. Last story, why we all don't work for the government, the rise of risk capital. Silicon Valley's second wave. We have research universities. We have a predictable economic system. We have a stable legal system. We have 24-7 utilities. We still have a great culture. We still don't have much management tools for startups. But now, all of a sudden, the emergence of venture capital. We're not doing startups anymore for just crisis, where now our motivation is profit. And for the first time, venture finance becomes the cycle of innovation in Silicon Valley. Now, remember I said, Fred Terman sat on a couple of boards. Fred Terman was on the board of the first three IPOs in Silicon Valley. Varian, Hewlett Packard, and Ampex. One professor focused on all three of the first public companies. Now, risk capital, some of you might know, started as family money in the 1940s. J.H. Uh, Whitney out here uh, set up the first family office, wrote himself a check for $5 million. I'd love to do that too, but it wouldn't clear. Uh, Lawrence Ro <laughs> Rockefeller actually funded the first venture capital firm that had a limited partnership, Draper, Gra uh, Gaither, and Anderson. It actually became Venrock, Bessemer, all East Coast focused for a wide variety of industries, not just electronics. But family money post-World War II was funding innovation in a way that no one else had ever done. The rise of risk capital started with rich kids post-World War II. But the first venture capital firm was actually this guy. Anybody recognize him? George DeRoe, Harvard professor, taught a famous manufacturing class and in 1946 sets up the first VC firm, American Research and Development. 26 years invested in 119 companies, 97 were profitable, and that's not a typo got a 70,000% return on a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. Invested $70,000, got a $400 million return. I missed that fund. Um, and on the West Coast, a bunch of angels started investing out of San Francisco. 10 deals, 75 dollars to $300,000. Um, 
And one of them remembers the first 25 electronic companies required a total capital of $300,000 each. In 1975, the entire VC industry, entire industry raised $10 million. What changed was in 1958, the US government, in response to the Soviet Union launching Sputnik, said we need to make innovation happen. We will match three to one any private capital investment. And so the SBIC Act sets up a whole set of funds or enables a whole set of funds. 700 SBIC funds are set up by 1965. By the mid-60s, 75% of all VC funding was through this government program. Bank of America starts, Fireman's Fund, etc. A whole set of private companies all become government-funded SBIC funds. Now, just for scale, by the way, to help you understand the leverage of venture capital, here was the defense budget for R&D from the 1950s to 1970s. And I don't know if you can see the numbers, but right here is about $30 billion. Now, here was California's per portion of that for R&D, about $5 billion. And by the way, here's how much Silicon Valley, not LA, not anybody else, got for defense R&D Looks like to me, I don't know, maybe a billion dollars at best. Now, you can't see this here, but this is Silicon Valley venture capital. Notice the scale? So let's zoom in a bit. It's still almost negligible. So the government is pumping billions, tens of billions of dollars into R&D Silicon Valley venture capital is infinitesimal compared to that. Yet what came out of Silicon Valley venture capital in the 60s and 70s were all the semiconductor companies, all the computer companies, because all of a sudden we were incented, incented to start innovation on a scale we've never seen before. And what happened was the limited partnership emerged as the way to do this. Venture firms discovered you could raise money from pension funds, private universities, and investment professionals would manage the fund, and you'd compensate the general partners with what's called 2 and 20. 2% 2 management fee, 20% carried interest, and the first venture funds, Draper Gaither Anderson, Rock and Davis, Sutter Hill, Patrickoff, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia, all started to emerge. In 1978 and 1979, the government changed the rules, capital gains were slashed, and for the first time, pension funds could invest in venture funds. The amount of money available went from millions to billions, and all of a sudden, Silicon Valley is now driven by this cycle of entrepreneurship and venture capital. So the epilogue, we're almost done, one slide. Epilogue, 9-11, the National Security Agency misses 9-11. They had all the data. They never put it together. They vowed never again move signals intelligence from what we were doing in the Cold War, which was analyzing Soviet Union's communications intelligence, telemetry, undersea cables, to now the web. And we decide we're going to target everything. So the summary is Terman and Stanford determined the government were responsible for the outward-facing culture of Stanford, built the entre uh, entrepreneurial culture of Silicon Valley, massive follow-on by John Hennessy when he became president of Stanford, doubled down in making Stanford an outward-facing university. Military primed the pump as a customer, but there was very little cross-fertilization. The only thing the military was was a great customer for Silicon Valley, but it was venture capital and entrepreneurs that made it happen. So that's the secret history of Silicon Valley. Thank you very much.